Iniziamo, buon pomeriggio a tutti. So let's get started and good afternoon everyone. This afternoon we thought about sharing with you a very important topic, uh, that is to say a female entrepreneurship in the fashion industry. And there are several reasons that led us to establish this uh, subject matter. First of all, because it is very topical, and uh, second of all, because uh, it is deeply felt uh, amongst us at uh, Mirtas. Um, the entrepreneurial skill is uh, indeed uh, quite uh, deeply rooted in our company. Uh, our company grew at a very fast pace and we all embrace it um, every single day. I started out in 2020 and it was a team of eight, now we're over 50. 71% of our employees are women and the great majority of them uh, have taken up uh, executive positions. So it's a very dear to us topic and uh, we have gone the extra mile over the past few months, uh, so much so that we launched a campaign on the occasion of uh, the um, World's uh, Woman Day. And uh, in order to start with this campaign, we ask ourselves this question, that is to say, um, how are we faring with regards to female entrepreneurship uh, in this industry? And uh, how are we doing and where do we stand vis-a-vis -vis the companies we work on a daily basis? So we decided to start uh, from this topic and we're very pleased to discuss this topic uh, with four uh, top-notch entrepreneurs and they will introduce themselves and that's why I'm going to leave the floor to Andrea. Well, thanks very much, Alessia. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I am the only man here on the stage, and I'm very pleased to be in the company of these uh, outstanding uh, entrepreneurs. I would like to start uh, with uh, Sara Zucchini. So tell us a little bit about your experience and uh, what specifically prompted you to become uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, Sara is the founder of Via Fratelli Lombardi Uno. Let's see if we can get the microphone working. Yes. All right, so it's great to be live. So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much for inviting me. I would like to thank Mipo and Mirta uh, for welcoming us today to discuss uh, um, a very important topic, uh, which is uh, dear to us. Um, Via Fratelli Lombardi Uno was set up uh, uh, in 2019, about 10 months before uh, the pandemic struck. And uh, we are experiencing a significant uh, growth uh, because we opened up a new point of sale uh, in the Tuscan um, area nearby Forte dei Marmi. And when I decided to um, to run this business, and no one could have ever predicted a, a global pandemic and this tough um, time of, of warfaring. I was a former uh, professional athlete, and uh, first of all, this was um, a personal need of mine, um, frankly speaking. I've always been very fond of fashion, and at a certain point in time, I had grown quite bored with it, and um, I thought it was quite obsolete, it was a bit redundant, and I felt quite sorry about that, because I, I've always had this passion, um, and uh, it sort of... Um, I found myself considering customer experience very mainstream. In the world of fast fashion, for example, which might be dictated by luxury or um, low-cost uh, strategies, um, well, it doesn't really make a difference because the purchasing experience in Milan is uh, exactly the same that one could have in Dubai or uh, in New York because that's what brands do. They launch humongous collection that... Uh, do not pursue that specific added value that uh, results directly from uh, the uh, craftsmanship, uh, craftsmanship of, of a localized uh, manufacturing entity. So, uh, Via Fratelli Lombardi Uno uh, 
is the result of my own desire, so to satisfy my own needs uh, in terms of clothing and fashion, first off. Becoming an entrepreneur is particularly difficult uh, nowadays. Um, as stated, I was a, I'm a former athlete, uh, and my upbringing uh, and uh, the entrepreneurial culture that I uh, leveraged on because uh, my family was a, is a family of entrepreneurs uh, based in Brescia and my past experience influenced uh, my, my career and has taught me a great lesson. First of all, being uh, hard-headed and being uh, persistent is one of my key skills and uh, this is something that I am uh, putting into my efforts in order to find the right key to success. A former athlete of, well, I was a tennis player. I played tennis for very many years. Right. It's a very trendy sport, by the way. Um, well, Irene, Irene Arrighi. I-R-E-R-I. I-R-E-R-I. What does it stand for? Well, my twin sister, Erica, maybe you want to say something, Erica, from the audience. Uh, well, we are... Our mother, Theresa, founded and created this brand, and she passed away, unfortunately. So we are her daughters, and she started out back in 2008, and she um, developed this brand for uh, top-ranking design leather bags and accessories called, and the name was uh, Ireri, I-R-E-R-I. We're based in Florence, and that's where we operate from. We run our own uh, shop in Florence, and together with Erika, we intend to pursue our mom's dream, which has by far become uh, our own dream. And I feel uh, very and deeply honored to be here today, together with these uh, wonderful panelists. And I still believe that I am an amateur, if you will, in this business, but I'm very willing to learn from, from people around me. Right, so it's a second generation uh, story, but it's, it's a pink, if you will, story. Indeed, uh, Roberta Zambelletti, and I'm going to ask you the very same questions. I'm not going to repeat it, and uh, the microphone, I'm afraid, is off. And there you go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Umberta Zambelletti. I'm the founder of Wait and See, uh, which is a, a concept store that I opened up in Milan back in 2010. Uh, frankly speaking, I've always worked as a fashion advisor, and I also worked in the design industry. Wait and See was created because back in 2009, during one of my nth consultations in the fashion industry, I was a creative director at uh, uh, the dear uh, old uh, UPIM, UPIM department store, and um, it got acquired by uh, um, a fund, uh, a venture fund, and uh, we wanted to relaunch the brand, uh, which was uh, the, the, the single mainstream uh, price. Um, based model. So I embarked on this um, journey and I didn't know precisely uh, how many uh, collections I had to deploy and uh, it ended up being 30 and uh, the average price was 1990. So it was, let me say, very interesting. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a great challenge and, and I'm glad I'm, I'm still alive. Frankly speaking, I believe this was the best um, way for me to learn how to merge creativity with merchandising. I managed to combine uh, uh, my thinking, my reasoning, and passion. And to combine them both in, in a business model. I, I've always been a, a no-brand person, and uh, I didn't want to, to spend much for my clothes, and uh, I've never been frivolous uh, fashion-wise, and I realized that in the market there was a missing link between uh, luxury brands and uh, uh, the so-called 
um, high street shops. Uh, we didn't have such a concept in Milan, and I decided then to to set up a wait and see. And uh, now uh, we have many more of these uh, concept stores, but back in the old days, uh, uh, it was the first one. I see approximately 200 brands every season uh, to purchase about 120. So I like to have a very intense life. And I wanted this um, place, uh, this environment to be joyful. I wanted for it to be an invitation to women to to go all out and uh, to step outside uh, by representing themselves uh, in uh, their preferred uh, mood. And I decided then uh, to embark on the wait and see journey uh, in order to cater to the needs uh, of all age brackets and for all women in an environment that was meant to be very comfy with uh, a very uh, well um, organized customer service. So. I had an assistant. I never thought uh, about uh, myself being an entrepreneur, first off. So the job title, namely entrepreneur, um, is still uh, a bit unusual, if, if you will. So a wait and see um, has 15 uh, employees. Uh, we purchased a new office. We run our own e-commerce website. and. Uh, we launched it two days after the uh, lockdown measure, and it was a lifesaver, I have to say. We have a pretty broad clientele uh, on an international basis, and I have to say that uh, it has been very passionate throughout. And I cannot deny the fact that these two years have been uh, quite tough, and uh, they don't seem to end. Unfortunately, we are off to a very bad start of the year, as, as we all know, I'm afraid. And so we are selling dreams, if you will, uh, um, in a time where uh, people are strangled by massive problems. And we keep asking, so us, asking ourselves uh, how um, to do that in order to um, respect um, customers' needs, uh, wishes, and demands. And we are in search of a constant uh, daily balance. And uh, we do that with, with zest uh, and uh, a great deal of intensity, I have to say. So I'm very glad to be to be here, and uh, I ventured out uh, back back in the years, and uh, um, here I am today. I'm deeply touched to be here today, and I'm um, really glad for you to, to be here um, with a desire to listen to our own stories. Martina Capriotti, you uh, are the co-founder of Mirta, uh, right? Um, that's right. Together with Ciro, correct. And in fact, 70% um, um, of, of us are women, but I have to say that it was a very natural process. Uh, uh, we uh, never thought about deciding it up front, uh, and uh, we never thought uh, or reasoned in terms of gender equality. Uh, Mirta is uh, a marketplace platform uh, that brings the best Italian brands and, desires, uh, and designers um, to the international uh, arena, uh, and the idea stems from mine and Ciro's experience. Uh, we met uh, at Boston Consulting Group. We worked in strategic consulting. I was also working in fashion. He wasn't. And then uh, he moved to Stanford because he wanted to study uh, the model of uh, technological startups. Uh, I moved to Asia between uh, Korea and Japan. I was still working with Boston, and I work for fashion brands. And back then, I uh, was working on the project uh, to, to transfer production back to Italy because uh, there was a lot of uh, there was a rising demand for made in Italy products. And so I des we decided to merge uh, this um, technology uh, know how and create a marketplace uh, where a demand and offer could meet, uh, and by way of which 
new brands could be um, identified. So Mirta is the result of our personal experience and is also the result of the desire to bring back to Italy the best we saw abroad as a result of our international experiences and to, to export the beauty of the made in Italy. We have um, listened to uh, four fantastic stories here and I would like to ask the following question to Martina. Uh, we ran some, some research and studies about uh, female entrepreneurship in the industry of uh, arts and crafts, fashion, uh, etc. So, um, where do we stand and what is Mieta doing in order to improve this? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Let's say that we're former consultants and so we always like crunching numbers to analyse what's going on and that's why we rolled out a questionnaire uh, for our brand partners to see what the situation was like in terms of women in business because the national figures are pretty concerning. They're telling us that only 22% of Italian businesses are headed by women and the World Economic Forum tells us that it'll take 135 years to bridge that gap. So truly, <laughs> that's that's concerning. But we are happy to see that if you look at uh, small businesses, uh, leather goods, textiles, for example, the percentage of female red women is 48% of the total. And looking at uh, the data from our questionnaires, we found that including in our Mirta uh, partners who sell through our platform, the situation is much better than it is nationwide. 42% of companies partnering us are headed by women. And that's something that I think tells us how much women are doing uh, to boost the Made in Italy label and how far we've come as women uh, to uh, put themselves out there and build something and steer and, and, and manage companies. We at Mirta are always asking ourselves, what can we do to make our contribution? We do it in-house by uh, giving space to women who deserve it, obviously, and enabling them to find their way in business. And on the other hand, in March this month, we rolled out a scholarship. And we're going to offer the scholarship to girls, to young women who want to set up a business, who want to head a business. And the scholarship will help them train, uh, acquire the tools that they'll need to uh, embark on that uh, career in business. So uh, based on the figures you've given us, 42% Italy-wide versus uh, in fashion versus 22% uh, companies headed by women in Italy. Uh, let me ask Uberta, is this uh, something I, I, I suppose you see positively, but it, does it have to do with the kind of product we're dealing with, that is fashion, or is there something else there? Well, I've thought about it, and in fact, listening to what I've just heard, I, it might sound odd, but, you know, I mean, I love men. <laughs> I'm not one of these angry, fierce feminists. I certainly am not. Uh, you can't call me a feminist by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but, of course, I know that women are heavily disadvantaged. But I think fashion is an area in which... Uh, men are maybe not hindering us, uh, maybe men have less experience, have less insights and maybe are dealing with their things and one little step at a time maybe we're making inroads, otherwise I just don't know why. Obviously women are good at doing everything, we multitask, uh, we know that it's, uh, it's a well-known fact and scientific uh, science has proven it, but maybe that's why men perhaps don't care so much. Irene, what do you have to say? Talking about handbags in particular, yes, I think that, well, if I think about my mum, uh, maybe it's a cultural thing. It's the way we're raised as kids. Uh, we're kind of um, encouraged to embark on certain pathways in our lives based on gender sometimes, but our mother, our mum, 
has always had a streak of a businesswoman in us, and she chose that career probably because uh, she found it easier to get into than maybe uh, other areas back then when she got into business. I mean, she founded the brand. Uh, at an older age, she was already 45, unless I'm mistaken, when she started up the business, and maybe she felt self-confident enough to uh, start um, tearing down barriers. I don't know whether she would have done that in other sectors. I think that uh, there's a, a cultural element there. There's, you know, your background, your family background. And what about you, Sara? How would you pick up the thread of what you've just heard? Well, I originally come from Brescia. So, uh, you know, the Brescia area is famous for its engineering industries. Maybe that is a bit of an influence. And listening to the previous answers, I would say that my answer would be, uh, I sit sort of somewhere in the middle. There is the cultural element, definitely. Uh, there is, there are choices and so on. But listening to the figures that Martina told us, I think that it very much depends on the industry, on the sector. As I was saying before, uh, my family was in business. My family was a typical um, mid-size industry in the Brescia district. My mum uh, did everything. She she was the mum, she was the friend, she was uh, the manager, and they sold orthopedic products. So, you know, manufacturing was pretty much in their blood. In our case, in, in fashion specifically, I would say that, as Roberta was saying before, fashion is gorgeous, it's frivolous, it's beautiful, and women have the freedom uh, to express themselves with their colors and fabrics and imagination uh, and so on. So I think they do that. Uh, uh, I know it's a cliché, but they kind of reconcile their work and uh, home lives. I have two stores. If I had a family, if I had children, uh, you know, bringing the child to the store during the day wouldn't be too much of a problem for me or for the client. If I was working in a factory, as a lot of women do in Brescia, and you're working on machinery, you couldn't do that. So uh, I think that uh, we're sort of sitting halfway in between. The business itself, fashion, certainly does help us. Okay, why don't I ask another question to all of you, starting from Sara. Let me ask you how important cooperation is, teamwork is, between women in business, and to what extent does that um, help you be successful? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, let's start by saying that cooperation, empathy, teamwork uh, between businessmen, uh, between businesses and suppliers, businesses and consumers, well, cooperation is the name of the game. And when you're talking about women, well, the sky's the limit, basically, because we women share things. We share perhaps the same vision. We share the same priorities. We also share, how can I put it? Irene was saying it before. Uh, there's also, as, a, as Irene said, the cultural element that we perhaps share. And when all that comes together, it's going to be successful willy-nilly. So there's affinity between and among women when we are able to communicate and uh, and cooperate. Maybe because, as I said, we share similar a similar vision and uh, it's very much a question of the times and, and, uh, and how far, far-sighted women are. I'm not saying that men are not. Uh, I'm not saying that men are not far-sighted and tenacious, but basically we women tend to have completely different life experiences than men, and we make different sacrifices to men on a day-to-day -day basis, and I say this all the time. Uh, I mean, a woman's routine starts in the morning by doing a zillion things, you know, makeup, hair, choosing your outfit, where you have to go, who you're meeting, and so on and so forth. Men don't always have that much, you know, to do. They have their coffee, <laughs> they maybe comb their hair if they have hair, and they're out the door. 
sure. So even in terms of your day-to-day -day routine, uh, there are, women have to do so many things. Um, it's a completely different uh, scenario to women. But going back to the question, I think that cooperation between women, uh, when they do cooperate, when we are on the same plane and we, when we bring together our ideas and they converge, I mean, no, nothing can stop us. Literally, the sky's the limit. We're, we're tanks. You know, we uh, just line up our ducks in a row and off we go. When we can uh, work on a project and, and bring it to fruition, whether it's a child or a business, I mean, here I'm talking genuinely as a woman, then truly we have no competition at all. We share the same values. We understand each other uh, with a single glance. We, we know how to manage our routine and how to get things done. And if I may, I'd like to tell you a little story about my own personal experience. Well, about our experience between my uh, people at uh, Fratelli Lombardi Uno at Mirta. This was my first uh, business partnership, although like Uberta, I'm still kind of struggling to work out who I am, what I am. You know, I, I, I'm a retailer, I, I, I like doing that, I know how to do it. But this is our first partnership between Mirta and Fratelli Rombardi Uno, because Mirta is headed by a woman, a young, super smart woman, Martina, and she's uh, she sees things very much the way I do. We have very much the same mindset. Um, there's a lot we have in common, and we decided to embark on this partnership together because we share the same goal, which is to grow and to disseminate uh, the Made in Italy label worldwide. So I take care of the physical side of the business. We've put together our skills and our abilities. Uh, we've kind of looked at each other, watched each other. Mirta is good at doing certain things, and everyone knows Fratelli Lombardi, one does other things just as well, but we decided to put our skills together and uh, obviously bring consumers uh, to a consumer experience, which can be called digital, physical and digital. I like calling it uh, a multi-channel experience because when consumers consumers buy an Italian-made product, uh, we want them to buy genuine Italian-made products because on a daily basis, we work with uh, uh, businesses, companies like Irene's that make extraordinary products. We have to tell the story that they're telling. It's, it's what we're all trying to do. We're telling the story of uh, Italian products and there are channels for purchasing those products. And it can be done a zillion ways, either physically or digitally. So uh, I think the cooperation that we've put that we've created can be something really powerful. It can be a real game changer, not just for us on our side, for our own businesses, but for small businesses, for um, the crafts uh, and the, the artisans who, with the craftspeople and the artisans with whom we work on a daily basis, on a basis. Uh, and all this is very heavily uh, influenced by women. And in a few years' time, if we continue growing the way I hope we will, it will be the result of uh, two uh, female-led businesses. What was the percentage? Yours is 70% uh, female, mine is 100% uh, as it happens. I have very, a very small staff, but they're all women. Yeah, I'd like to ask the same question now to Irene, because we're talking about uh, 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 two sisters, a uh, very women-oriented business. Yes, it's true when my sister Erica and I talk business, it's a bit different. It's difficult sometimes because we're twins. Uh, we've always lived together. And, you know, a, a family business is not always the easiest thing to deal with. Uh, but it certainly does give huge satisfaction. It can be very gratifying. Uh, I mean, as I said, uh, we're twins at home and at work. And that's probably a little bit rare. 
probably not too common. And as Sara said, I think cooperation and teamwork, whether it's between men and women or women and women, well, it underpins anything, everything, if you're hoping to grow and thrive. So there you go. That's what I had to say. OK, let me go back to Martina for a minute. Was your background important? I mean, I guess your background was important for uh, taking you where you are today. How much of an influence was your background on uh, developing what you then uh, undertook and made successful? Yes, my background was extremely important for building uh, what you can see today, the business we have today. I couldn't have done anything uh, of what I'm doing today had I not had the experience um, I had. I, I was uh, an athlete as a young kid, and uh, I know what teamwork is all about. I know what it's like to uh, be in a team and try uh, seek to win. I mean, that was the goal. And that's what I'm still doing today. Uh, my attitude is, however big the problem may be, uh, if you put your heart and mind to it, you can solve the problem. You can deal with it. And, and I go to work every day uh, with great enthusiasm. And going back to my experience in Japan, that taught me how little they knew about Italy and how many opportunities there were for many small companies uh, to make it in that market and to get well known in those markets. So uh, working in the fashion business taught me how the value chain was created, how it worked, and how many things could be leveraged and how many opportunities were out there to be grasped. For example, working with my co-founder, uh, his previous life, his previous career, uh, enriched me and gave me the self-confidence I needed to uh, get into it and dive in the deep end of uh, the business experience. So truly, I think it's a combination of uh, many of experiences that I've had, personal and private and, and uh, professional, and you can see that in the business. It's this cultural baggage that I've created and um, that I've leveraged and am using in my everyday career. But above and beyond uh, your experience with uh, UPIM, uh, it feels like you were uh, very much in a kind of a guerrilla war warfare when you were working at UPIM. What can you tell me? about your past experience and, well, today, I think each and every one of us are the uh, outcome of our past experiences and transforming that into a career, into uh, a successful business is not an easy thing. Um, I mean, for example, my mother used to dress me in navy blue or brown and look at me now. So, you know, it all ties in. It's all sort of intertwined. And my experience of UPIM taught me a great deal. But it depends very much on um, your outlook, on how you see life, because, uh, yes, UPIM taught me uh, a lot of technical things, but it also opened my eyes, and I started realizing what was missing on the market. And uh, again, it taught me to really open my eyes and, and just see what was missing uh, and what I could do to bridge those gaps. Whatever you're doing, when you're cooking, for example, even, uh, sometimes you see a recipe and then you think, well, maybe I could tweak that recipe. Mm, maybe nobody's yet put cumin in, in whatever you're making and maybe that'll make a difference. And I think that needs cultivate, cultivating. That's something that you need to keep doing. Well, one last question to wrap this conversation up. I'd like to start with Martina. One piece of advice to young women who want to become entrepreneurs. Only one, right? <laughs> Just kidding. 
Well, there is one thing I'd like to say which might sound a bit uh, uh, trivial, but uh, um, the importance of dreaming big. Because if one really wants to achieve a big dream, um, well, we need to, um, to think, I got this, I can do it. So dreaming big is indeed very important. It can be very frightening at times, but uh, one must uh, be in a position to take that risk, uh, to make that jump, and uh, to embrace the vision. Like, look, I got this. And I think this is a fundamental pre-requirement in order to embark on this career. Umberta. Fare i numeri. Well, you have to uh, do the numbers, as we say. Uh, that's my uh, main advice to younger generations. And, um, and probably uh, this could have been your second piece of advice, right? Because it's something I truly believe in. So to make your own business plan, to make forecasts, to run your analysis. There is no single dream that can thrive without solid foundations. And I'm telling you this because I was suffering, I was dysleptic. And uh, I, uh, I, I, you know, passed my final exam without uh, uh, sitting for the math test because true school didn't realize that. Numbers uh, will speak for themselves uh, and uh, numbers will make you sleep at night because the numbers will tell you uh, where to improve and how to um, fill the gap. So this is a must. Well, I, I'm not, I don't feel in a position to uh, provide advice to anyone, but I would like to emphasize the importance of being resilient. I am the result of uh, a resilient mother. And so I think that resilience is of the essence. Right. Ovviamente per cerco di non cadere del banale, ma diciamo Well, I don't want to sound trivial and I think that the three of them have already spoken the world to me. Uh, if I may add on that, uh, one a little piece of advice uh, to young entrepreneurs is uh, just hang in there. Don't lose heart because there is always a solution to every problem. And be bold, ask questions all the time. The system as a whole is there to help us. And let me give you a very simple example. When I opened up my store, I had scant resources because uh, I had worked uh, another job uh, in another industry. Now I understand that uh, uh, the EU provides a lot of uh, funding uh, and sponsorships to women. Uh, you just have to Google female or women entrepreneurs uh, or entrepreneurships. And and you'll see that there are a lot of tools, a lot of solutions that can really be helpful. And they provide guidance to young women in understanding uh, which is the best way forward. So the key to success could be this, like uh, uh, where am I going to find uh, capital, uh, etc. Well, there are a lot of entities that do this. So there are a lot of tenders uh, for women entrepreneurial projects, and the EU is investing a lot. So it's an excellent tool to become entrepreneurs. So that's my uh, piece of advice. And, you know, we tend to say that uh, the banks give you uh, an umbrella when outside it's sunny. <laughs> so um, let's use that umbrella. So, well, thank you very much. Um, we made it till the end, and uh, thanks very much for sticking with us. You were very successful in keeping everyone involved and interested. Well, I would like to thank Sara Zucchini. Let's give her a big hand. Irene Arrighi. Irene Arrighi. Uberta Zambeletti. Uberta Zambeletti. E Martina Capriotti. Martina Capriotti. Grazie davvero. 
Thank you very much. And please stay with us. And I'm going to anticipate what's going to be aired. Um, Marina uh, Salamon was uh, supposed to be with us today in order to tell us a little about her past and current experience uh, as a wonderful uh, female entrepreneur. We interviewed her, and unfortunately, uh, she's not going to make it today uh, due to a family engagement. Uh, and uh, so we managed to have her with us virtually with this video recorded interview. Uh, Alessia and I interviewed her, and uh, she. Uh, tell us a lot about uh, the leather industry and she is actually a minority stakeholder of the Florence group uh, and uh, so which is a very successful uh, case history and I think that uh, Marina does not require any introductions. Uh, she's a well-known entrepreneur and she paved the way to a major branding projects, uh, especially uh, for um, the um, premium um, children apparel brands and also the Save the Dark uh, project, uh, which was passed on to um, an investment fund and uh, a series of other partnerships with um, top-notch brands. During this interview, she told us very interesting um, things about the world of entrepreneurship. So let's enjoy the, the video interview. Well, good morning to Marina Salomon, and many thanks for being with us virtually, but with um, zest at Meeple. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation to participate to this talk, um, which opens up with this first interview with you, Marina, and many thanks to Alessia Primavera for being here with me. And as etiquette mandates, I'm going to pass it over to Alessia for the first question. The first question I would like to ask you, precisely because you have a great deal of entrepreneurial experience, is this. I would like to start by asking you how you think the world of female entrepreneurship has changed since you stepped into the world uh, to date. I think that female entrepreneurship has grown, and, and that's positive, and I think it will continue to thrive. I believe that in a world where uh, there are no dividing attitudes between men and women, um, I don't believe in a world where women entrepreneurs are confined to quote-unquote protected areas of the business universe, but rather I believe in a world where men and women have complementary and parallel paths. So putting together work teams so that don't bear the feminine or masculine label will be essential to build towards the future. It seems to me that Italy is changing. I started my career 40 years ago, and it was, of course, a different world. But in an attempt to be provocative, I would say that the topic of the future isn't going to be the space given to women, but for us all, especially for young people, will be our ability to combine our emotional and family life with work. And I believe it is easier to accomplish that by being an entrepreneur. So I strongly encourage this attitude. In the presentation of this interview, we touched upon the milestones of your career, and we're not going to go over them now in the interest of time, but during your long career as, as one of the first women uh, managers in history in the world of fashion, what have been the key hurdles that uh, you have faced? in your professional activity because you're a woman and so you had to measure up to a male-dominated world for the most part. Uh, quite frankly, I find it difficult to answer this question 
because I believe that the difficulties I have encountered are the very same difficulties, for example, that all young men and women entrepreneurs had and have to tackle today and back in the 80s. For example, in Italy, banks have never been very keen on uh, supporting startup companies, neither in the 1980s nor today. And now they demand collateral, such as real estate assets or money pledged as collateral. But I learned, I studied, and I understood very quickly how to run a company from the financial standpoint in a very rigorous fashion. I've never separated our family finances from the company's assets. And this has built me a reputation of solidity, I hope. I come from a family of strong working women, and this has certainly helped me a lot. No one in my family was an entrepreneur. I was the first one, and I wasn't afraid. Let's say that the key point here, if I can convey what I hope is a useful message, is this. Let's start by believing that we can do this. We got this. Even if we're going through rough times, uh, first with the pandemic and now the war, but there were other problems uh, back in the days, so it has never been easy. I remember that I left with a bag filled with samples, one sample for each product, so it was quite challenging and uh, it was um, an artisanal kind of world in which it was allowed um, for us to start by selling to a small chain of, for example, Rome-based stores, eight to ten, that would ultimately pay me little by little. In a globalized world, either you are good at managing your digital strategy, and Alessia can tell us more about that, or you, you just fail. So the market dimension and uh, the size of our competitors have changed. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, according to your experience, uh, do you think that fashion can be considered a sector or an industry with a high, uh, with a high rate of uh, female uh, managerialism. Was it like that years ago, or has it there been an evolution in this direction? Forgive me, but the term manager doesn't mean entrepreneur. It means manager. So let's not mix these terms up, because they delineate two perfectly complementary but different roles. I think the problem doesn't really lie in the number of women but in the number of women in leading positions in fashion, for example, there are so many women who, who work so much more than men. The problem is that if they are, for example, pattern makers or, uh, for example, if they succeed in running their own pattern making company, as an example. And the problem again isn't the university degree proper, but rather the importance of learning to become an entrepreneur. And this is a wider dimension uh, in that an entrepreneur must manage so many sectors, manufacturing, distribution, marketing, product collections, finance and back office, and logistics, so very many. I believe that this is the first generation of women who really work outside the home. We are 
the representatives of a young uh, capitalism. The next generation of young people will change things a lot because women are graduating more and better than men. And all this will certainly have a real impact on, on reality. There is one thing, though, that can hold us back, that is to say, our self-confidence that we can do it. Um, I confess, so you don't think that I'm a superwoman. I've spent years thinking everything is going well in my work, and uh, am I going to be punished by not being able to raise my kids, or will I be punished because my husband will leave me? Uh, well, you see, we mix certainties with concerns or fears for life. And this is a theme that really appeals to everyone. This is not really a country for young people or women yet. It's our turn to change it. It's up to us to change it. Somehow you anticipated the next question that relates to gender balance, which concerns the, the business world, but also the industry representatives, business associations, institutions. Where do you stand? For or against? Well, the gender balance strategy, or so-called um, women quarters, have only been instituted within the boards of directors of listed company, which in Italy are a small minority. At first, uh, I was against it. Uh, it seemed to me that we were, in a way, recreating or reinstituting Indian reservations, which didn't bring so much luck to the to the Native Americans, except for the fact that they established casinos for for gambling. And I'm speaking of the U.S. now. So, they did make waves, but they didn't impact on all those companies that aren't listed on the stock exchange. So, in my view, the real point is that fathers, for example, must understand that it is better to pass on their business to their smart daughter than to the at-all-cost son. So... We must think in terms of marriage, I, and I mean to be provocative here. Businesses shall not necessarily be passed on to, to children or family members, but rather we must keep lucidity to discern what is good for our company, joining forces with a good and serious competitor, perhaps reducing one's shareholding, but guaranteeing a future or remaining isolated by handing it over to the kids at all costs. We have a wonderful generation of founders, but now they're starting to be in their 60s or 70s. Uh, so what would what do we do? Small is no longer attractive. And this was once said. So I see a patchy Italy with scattered excellences. And um, it, this doesn't apply only to um, leather goods, but to the whole fashion industry. And again, I believe in the value of learning a profession well, even outside of the family setting, and to bring these skills into the family company and to generate added value or to set up one's own company by leveraging on these skills. Well, thank you so much. I'd like to go back for my next question to what you said um, a while ago. That is to say that there is still a lot to do in Italy, but um, in your opinion, in the past, um, has there been a woman who marked the turning point and then opened the doors uh, and the way for other women to reach top-ranking positions? Yes. Careful, though, because the great entrepreneurs that I know Well, they team up to help other women. It's not true that they are jealous of one another. In general, I think, and Andrea will correct me if I'm wrong, um, that regardless of whether they are men or a woman, the good ones don't spend time trying to destroy others, but they help each other for the good of the projects. But note that there are 
examples of great women entrepreneurs in fashion. There are not that many. Names such as Elisabetta Franchi, onwards, but in the end there are not so many. Or the great Miuccia Prada, who managed their business in partnership with her husband. Amazing, great. Other examples of um, reputable women uh, with very large industrial groups are found in other sectors, perhaps in the metalworking sector uh, or in other industries. So I think, yes, uh, they normally have no difficulty giving space to other women executives. Uh, based on my experience, uh, they consider it a value. But I repeat, We're still at the beginning of a journey. Italy is not Sweden. Italy is not Germany. And besides, um, capitalism happened in the 1960s, 1970. Before that time, Italy was a predominantly agricultural country. Uh, we must acknowledge that. So we don't have 120 years of industrial history behind us like other countries do. And I would like to have your point of view on a specific aspect. So typically, um, when a corporate crisis happens, such as the one I'm facing with my newspaper, we think of, of women workers who pursue a certain profession because they're suited to certain types of professions, like, for example, embroiderers. Uh, men typically pursue other walks of life. Let's think in terms of other company functions or positions and in terms of Marina Salamon as an entrepreneur who hired men and women. Have you ever distinguished in terms of roles, thinking that a woman is more suited for her own sensitivity to that type of role, excluding her from some other roles because it is better suited for a male? No way. Absolutely not. I was not a feminist. I never was as a teenager, as a young woman. I think I went to two feminist meetings in my whole life and was bored to tears. And I said, no, no time for theory. I want to get my hands dirty. I always thought that all skills being equal, it was my duty to give women what they deserved all skills being equal, so based on meritocracy at all costs. And that was something I thought, not just out of the goodness of my heart, but because I knew, and time proved me right, that women are more loyal, harder workers, less hungry for power, and maybe even less bashful than men about asking for raises. But they are great assets for the company. So my idea was, let's prove that it's possible. For example, in my own company, our heads of finance, finance and administration have always been women. Other units have been headed by men and women, but, for example, running Altana, my own company, the fashion brand of our group, we have a male and a female, two heads, co-heads of finance, each of them with their own separate areas of responsibility and with brilliant careers behind them. So the traditional allocation of duties based on gender makes no sense. What does make sense is recognizing that today technical skills are not enough. You also need to be a team leader. And that comes from emotional intelligence, which is not the same as rational intelligence, and from acquired skills. So to run production, it's not enough to know how to to check quality. You've also got to have the right logical and organizational mindset that might not be easy to find in candidates, and you may find it in a man or a woman. And the same actually goes for insights into products, and I'm all in favor of what in English is called diversity and inclusion. So I say no to hiring on the basis of gender, sexual orientation, religion, or whatever. Absolutely not. What matters is the individual and their abilities.
Yes, absolutely. That's how it should be. Everything should be based on merits. But outside of business, in places like conferences and institutional meetings and so on, have you ever thought to yourself, oh, here I am again, the only woman in the room? Mm. Yes, but it never bothered me because... For example, the number of women running associations is a bit like the tip of an iceberg, where you've got one-tenth above the water and nine-tenths below. So not all trade organizations have grown and evolved at the same pace. And let's ask why. Take Confindustria, the Confederation of Italian Industry, uh, which I used to be a member of but haven't been for several years now. Well, at Confindustria, there have been female presidents of both the young entrepreneurs section and the adult senior industrialists, and I never sensed any differences whatsoever. I was a colleague amongst other colleagues. And I measured myself based on my success at work and based on my the performance of my business, but also at the personal level. It was a bit like being at boarding school with lots of chatty friends. So I can't judge other trade associations or institutions. I think everyone should draw their own conclusions. But generally, they are not the most forward-looking places or the most progressive places in Italy. We live in a country that unfortunately still puts its best foot forward privately and not publicly, but that also goes for politics. Maybe it's a question of a collective caring. I mean, our own backyards are flawless and the footpaths are littered. Maybe it's a question of feeling that you belong to the same country or system, feeling responsible for ourselves and also for others. I find that, like schools that have rusty fences, are very sad indeed. Not just because the fences need painting and maybe the authority should take care of it, but because the parents are not setting up teams and buying the paint and going along on a Sunday morning to paint the fences with their kids. They're not teaching their children anything. And I think that also should go for trade associations, which should come together transparently and honestly to deal with issues and not just pretending that everyone's on their own. Otherwise, we'll never compete with countries and manufacturers which may not be better than us individually, but certainly as a whole, they are way better as a system. So we can't go back to the Italy of the Middle Ages or the Renaissance, in which every individual republic was great, powerful, wonderful, but then along came foreign invaders and all hell broke loose for everyone because Florence was squabbling with Siena and Florence was squabbling with Rome and every fiefdom was at war with their neighbours. Marina, uh, let me ask you my last question and then I'll hand over to Alessia to wind up. So we're here at Mipel, the trade show where many own brand manufacturers are exhibiting. Sometimes they're partnering with big brand names. It's an industry that you know very well because with Altana, Marina Salomon was a real pioneer in forging major partnerships tailored to a major consumer target children's wear. And today, the big brands have taken over, but there is still a desire for the smaller brands to muster the creative strength to emerge, to leverage the history of uh, the specialized leather goods brands. So how do you see these two parallel processes? Oh, Marina, uh, forgive me. I called you by your first name. I hope that's okay. That's fine. That's fine. How do you see the future of Italian fashion? Is it still possible to be creative and to roll out and support smaller brands on international markets? Well, 
I don't think I can offer a diagnosis specifically for the leather goods sector because I don't know it very well. But I am convinced that, that the world we're living in today calls for a great deal of flexibility and openness. Companies today have to be able to coexist. They have to be able to take on manufacturing contracts for major brands. And if that's what they want to do, if that's what they can do, they also need to be able uh, to work with their own brands. I work in high-end children's apparel. And for many, many years, I managed our own private brands. But at a certain point, I gave up because I, I analysed the situation unemotionally and decided that it was better to cut off a finger than a hand or an arm. I mean, it was better at that point to cut my losses and deal with the issues around me now. I see a bit of a hodgepodge. Some are thriving, they're OK, and others are truly struggling. But... Certainly, I wouldn't in advise anyone to stubbornly defend an old idea if the old idea is just not working. At Altana, we have licensing agreements and manufacturing agreements with and for some very famous brands, top-notch brands, very strong and well-known ones. But let me tell you something else. I invested, I was an investor in the Florence Group, one of the other shareholders and investors is Francesco Trapani, a former shareholder of Bulgari. And initially, I didn't know how the formula played out. But then I analyzed the situation from the inside and I said, yes, of course, they're good. Because some agreements, some contracts with major names are, built, are best uh, dealt with as a group, continuing to manage one's own business. Perhaps not keeping full ownership, but maybe a 30% stake, say. So as a stakeholder in a bigger project, I never sold any of my own businesses to them. I just put my money in as an external investor. But every story is a story unto itself. You're doing okay. You've surrounded yourself with the next generation and they're talented and good. That's one thing. Or is the handover to the next generation causing problems? Every company will be different. What markets are you working on? Are they growing markets? Are they destined to continue growing? Let's say it's the United States. Or are they markets that are severely impacted by Ukraine, Russia, the European disaster? I don't have a, sim a silver bullet. But what helped us grow and, in fact, thrive, because Altana, Altana doubled its sales over the past three, four years, well, our performance has been outstanding despite such difficult, difficult times. I mean, what has helped us to thrive is our being humble, skilled, but also flexible about getting into different kinds of agreements with different kinds of partners. Always very carefully judging the quality of our partners, who are big league, top notch. That's, I think, the only thing I can hand down, I think, the only message I can convey. Thank you very much. So I'd like to wind up our little chat now with a question that I always ask the great women that I come across. I'd like to ask you for a piece of advice that you can share with young women keen to start a career as entrepreneurs. Well, my advice, the advice I give all young people, is please, and as I, I say this to everyone, uh, especially to my own kids, I say, I say, please beware. Don't fantasize about your own startup until and unless you have the necessary 
technical skills. For example, all too often, I'm seeing young women and young men coming to me and saying, yeah, I want to set up a business in such and such a sector, maybe apparel, fashion or whatever, food maybe, design, whatever. And I say, okay, but your qualifications are in something entirely different. You've never worked in that sector. Wouldn't it make sense for you to find a job in that business first, maybe just for a while, to learn the ropes? see where the opportunities lie, and then start making your dream come true. I've come across wealthy kids, boys and girls, who've said, yeah, but I've got the money and I've got a consultant. But I say, no, hold your horses. Consultants are not entrepreneurs. You are the entrepreneur. And if you don't know the first thing about manufacturing, say, or maybe you know all about manufacturing, but you know nothing about distribution, well, you'll get nowhere. It's not as important. You can't just make a product and then say, OK, what do I do with it now? Who do I give it to? So the real issue, I think, is that you can't succeed in business with nothing but a degree in your pocket. You may be lucky, but you need to be humble enough to learn what you don't know. Just think of Giorgio Armani. I mean, up until the age of 40 or 41 or 42, he was a window dresser and then a buyer for La Rinascente. So humble beginnings, but so smart. And then he rolled out his own line. Okay, others began as designers for big brands, great names, and then they started up their own businesses and so on. So, yes, capital is necessary, but it's not everything. You need to have a very clear view of the overall management of the company. That's what you need. And it's something you learn. I mean, some things just can't work. If I myself wanted to start up a restaurant, it'd be a disaster because I'm just not a good cook. <laughs> Maybe I'd try to save on ingredients or choose the wrong wines. Um, maybe I'd be good at getting the decor spot on, creating the atmosphere, but that'd be 20% of the business. The rest is something else. So that's my advice to those who are managing or inheriting a family business or starting up their own business from scratch. Ma Marina, thank you very, very much. That's it then. We look forward to seeing you at the next MIPEL. Thanks, Alessia, for putting together this interview. And all the very best for your work at the show. Thank you. All the best. Have a great life. Grazie.